Okay, we're rolling. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 24th of June, 2005, approximately 2.45 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Robert Janish. My place of birth was Brooklyn, New York. Okay. What was your... Uh, school background, your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, high school graduate. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction to Pearl Harbor, hearing about Pearl Harbor? Well, it was on a Sunday, I remember, a Sunday afternoon, and when I came home, I had a job to do. And when I came home that afternoon, my family broke the news to me that uh, Japan had attacked Pearl, Pearl Harbor. That's how I came to find out about that. Mm -hmm. oh, do you remember your reaction at all when you heard about this? Well, it was kind of mixed up. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect any wars to be breaking out so soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you enlist or were you drafted? Oh, I enlisted. Okay. Uh, why did you do you pick the Army Army Air Force? Uh, why, why did you do that? I loved to fly. I was uh, an apprenticed aircraft mechanic before the war broke out, mm -hmm. and I was I had my uh, student pilot certificate. I had uh, soloed a Piper J3 Cub and an old walkaway biplane, and uh, that's about the. And I just love to fly. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts did you fly out of? Roosevelt Field, Long Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's a big shopping center. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, when did you enlist? Uh, I think I was sworn in uh, May or June 14th of 1942. Mm -hmm. uh, Ninety. Was it? 93 or 73 Whitehall Street, and then we had to wait until the pipeline could take us, mm -hmm. and it was, wasn't until October 19th of 42 that I was called to active service, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. started us out at Classification Center at Montgomery, Alabama, or, no, wait a minute, Nashville, Tennessee, and then it was pre-flight at Maxwell Field. That was near Montgomery, Alabama. And then primary flight training at Carswell Field, Florida, and PT-17s. <laughs> and the amazing thing now, that place is a state insane asylum. They donated it to the state. And then Bainbridge, Georgia for basic training and then uh, Columbus, Mississippi for Twin Engine Advanced, and then to Columbus, Ohio for B-17 Transition School, and then an assignment to uh, the training. All right, how long did all of these, this training take? Uh, well, all the schools were of two months duration. Mm -hmm. And then we were sent after a B-17 school, we were sent to Salt Lake City, and they were starting a new bomb group, the 463rd, by this Colonel Kurtz. He was the one that uh, oh, had the book, The Swoops, It Flies. And then we trained over here for, oh, I don't know, but we went overseas, uh, now is this yeah, where you January. were you formed with your crew? Was it at Salt Lake City, or did you? That's where we formed a crew mm -hmm. for B-17. Okay. And uh, we went through all the rest of the training mm -hmm. phases together. Mm -hmm. Now and you were a pilot. Pilot. Now did you uh, go to an officer candidate school also in between? Heck, no. They didn't have any time. They wanted okay. us flying. So they just made you were a second lieutenant or a lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. All right. Now, did you fly across, or did you go by we ship? We flew across uh, from Fortaleza, Brazil, to Dakar, Africa. And then from there, 
one stop at uh, Marrakech, another stop at a place called Udna, about 10 or 20 miles south of Tunis, where we all got together and then we flew over as a group to Italy. Okay. And uh, of course the existing bomb group that we were stationed with was the second and they were running out of airplanes and they were still flying some of the old F's and we had the brand new G model and I was one of them that lost my airplanes so the 99th bomb group had airplanes and they transferred us over there my crew anyhow and it was a good thing the 463rd took heavy casualties. Mm -hmm. Now did you fly primarily the same air, airplane all the time? or No, no. Okay. Uh, I had one that I flew a lot mm -hmm. and I liked that one. That was a good one. Did you ever get to name a plane? Uh, no, but this one that I flew a lot was number was 068 and the name was Heaven Can Wait. It hmm. did. For me, anyhow. Did it have any kind of nose art on it or just the just the name? It just Heaven Can Wait. Okay. Well, we had one there. That I don't know how many missions it had. It, the name of it was The Innocent Bystander. Boy, that had more patches on it than <laughs> it always got hit. When was your first mission? All around. March of 40, 43, no, 44, March of 44. Could you tell us about it? Oh, let's see, yeah, it was, it was supposed to go up to, oh, I forget where, but we got stuck in some weather anyhow and we had to come home the whole it was an early return for the mm -hmm. whole outfit. And then there was another one. We were going up to, oh, it was a hellish place. There was a Messerschmitt, Junkers, and Falkwolf final assembly plants there. Oh, Weiner Neustadt. And they, they threw everything at us but the kitchen sink. But a lot of us got back, quite a few. Did you receive any flak damage to your aircraft on that mission? Well, now and then, but it was, it was all minor. Mm -hmm. It always came home, and that's, that's the important thing for us. How many missions did you fly? Well, we did what we had to, the 50 mission count, but a lot of them were counted as doubles, like Ploesti, mm -hmm. Rhein and Neustadt, and well, there's several other nasty ones. How far, how many times did you fly to Poesti? Oh, four or so. Could you talk about the missions to Poesti? They were pretty, that was pretty bad from what I've read. Well, there was a, a lot of flack around Poesti. That was the only natural oil refinery the Germans yeah. had. And they protected it pretty heavily. But, uh, on the bay, way back from one of the missions is when one of my uh, wingmen couldn't get his bomb bay closed or something, it was falling back a little bit, and uh, I stayed back there with him because uh, two airplanes have a better chance against enemy fighters than mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And that was when the uh, Tuskegee Airmen were in the vicinity. And this one on this W-190 passed so close over us, he wasn't shooting at us on the head-on pass. And uh, the top turret got on him and I could still hear it. Holy smoke, the bullets are bouncing right off him. And he turned around and then there was all this white burst with the orange center, the 20 millimeter. And I could feel the tail guns go off, it's just about a burst of two. And I said, what's the matter, tail, are they jammed? And he says, wouldn't you know, just when you need them most. 
and I didn't waste any more time. I punched in D channel for the fighter escort, gave them our location because they already do it. Mm -hmm. And four beautiful P 51s. And uh, I think the crowd made a mistake. He tried to out dive them. Mm -hmm. And four of them, I didn't see the rest. But we got home all right. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about the Tuskegee Airmen? Wonderful. Never, never did fault them for that. Mm -hmm. They could fly. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, they were the cream of the crop. Right. What were most of your targets? Uh, uh, railway, marshalling yards, aircraft factories synthetic oil plants and regular oil fields. Mm. Let's see what else. Very seldom did we go after any communications. Mm -hmm. I mean we left that to the the fighters like taking out bridges or something like that. But, mm -hmm. I mean when we dropped we dropped as a group. When the group leader dropped everybody dropped so we got a pattern. Mm -hmm. And if he missed, or wasn't too accurate, uh, we weren't too accurate. If he was right on, we clobbered him. Now and then that did happen. Mm -hmm. What would you say was, uh, was there any one time that you thought one of your missions was, was worse than others? Um, was more difficult in some way than others? Well, the hardest on me and I guess the co-pilot physically was when we drew an old F to go to uh, or some target. I forget which one it was. But anyhow, we couldn't get the Bombay doors shut. So I was sending the flight engineer back to us and his hands were kind of frozen so we couldn't turn that handle mm -hmm. to get the Bombay doors shut shut and that was done from the bomb base. So I took the walk around bottle and went back there and cranked it shut and I was sweating and oh it was cold. In fact that flight jacket after I got home the salt in it from my perspiration turned white. Mm. And then the superchargers of course were the old oil type four individual handles and they were going all over the place. And did you ever try and fly formation with four throttles and four supercharger handles at the same time? <laughs> Even my co-pilot gave up on it after a while. He was just exhausted too. We got it home all right, but thank God I never had to fly an F again. <laughs> so there was a big difference between the F model and, and the G model you the were G interested model in? The G model had first electronic superchargers, mm -hmm. and they worked from a single knob. Mm -hmm. And when you put them on a setting, they stayed on the setting. They didn't go wild like these old oil control ones did sometimes. And I think that was Minneapolis Honeywell, the same one that made the C-1 autopilots for the 17s. And they were, uh, boy, they were a sweat saver. Now you said when you went back, you, you got a portable bottle. What do you mean by that? portable oxygen b mm -hmm. bottle. I mean the hoses didn't stretch right. that far from the bomb bay to go mm -hmm. to the uh, my regulator. Mm -hmm. Now how large was this bottle that you carried? It was a small one. Mm -hmm. Oh I would say it was about the size of one of these small fire extinguishers. Mm -hmm. And we had several walk around bottles and when it got low we sent it back and they handed me a full one they could recharge from the regulators on board the ship. Mm -hmm. So it worked out pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now when you flew, did you uh, ever wear a flak jacket at all? Uh, yeah, they had flak jackets a little later on. Mm -hmm. And we put those on when we, just before we got to the target area. Because you usually didn't pick up flak mm -hmm. unless you were near some right. target. Right. Um, did you wear your parachute all the time? Well, I did. I had a backpack. Okay. Uh, this, and they had the chest packs that clipped on right. 
and you put them under your seat. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I liked it on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you wear one of the heated flight suits too? No, the only ones that had those on the 15th Air Force was the flight engineers and the ball turret gunners. Because mm -hmm. they were cold. The turret wasn't very windproof. And it definitely wasn't waterproof. Mm -hmm. It got caught in a rain squall. Mm -hmm. Did you carry a sidearm at all? Did I what? Carry a side weapon, a pistol or anything oh, like yeah. that? Oh yeah, we were issued 45s. Mm -hmm. Did you carry yours with you? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Bombardier was forced to. He had to assassinate the bomb site yes. in case uh, we were to go down in enemy territory. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have anyone on your plane ever wounded at all? or? Well, no Purple Heart. But it was close. It was my one waist gunner. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were coming back from Floesti. And I get the call on the intercom. Shell's been hit. That was my waist gunner's name. And I said, how badly? A nasty laugh from the other one. Wait till I get his pants down to find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, they had to get him out of his fleece line clothes. Well, Shell, there's no blood. You ain't going to get no purple heart, but you got the blackest, bluest, reddest backside I have ever seen. <laughs> and he still had the piece of flack. It wasn't very large. Mm -hmm. Maybe, oh, maybe a half inch long or something. And the poor waste gunner, he's dead now. What got him was tobacco. Mm -hmm. He died about four years ago. Emphysema. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Bombed the wrong places. We should have bombed the tobacco fields. <laughs> yes. Did you, uh, did the same crew stay together for all of your missions? Uh, most of the time because mm -hmm. they used to take a new crew when it came over. They'd separate them and put one of the men to go with an experienced crew mm -hmm. for his uh, baptism of mm -hmm. fire. And uh, now and then we had some rookies aboard. And uh, toward the end of my stay there, I was the flight leader. <coughs> and we came back from this one mission and one of my new wingmen, they just checked him out. He'd already gone through his baptism of fire, and he stayed. No matter what we did, he was right there. And after we landed, his name was Weiss. I said, Weiss, how many hours you got in B-17s? And he says, oh, he says, well, I was a flight instructor in him, and I wanted to get into combat, and I, fly, and I finally made it. <laughs> I said, you idiot, you're the next flight lead. <laughs> but he was a good pilot. Did you ever get to see any USO shows while you were? Oh, yes. Yeah. There was a few of them that came through to the outfit. Mm -hmm. They were funny. Mm -hmm. they, they were something to be looked forward to. Mm -hmm. They had some pretty American girls. The poor Italian women there, of course, they had these big sand fly bites all over them and big red sources. <laughs> Not for me, and I was young then. <laughs> now, did, what kind of food did you have while you were there? Were you fed pretty well? Basically two kinds, ration C and then for change C ration. One was meat and beans and the other was beans and meat. <laughs> but now and then we got uh, some uh, roast chicken mm -hmm. or a pork chop. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, that was looked forward to, I tell, mm -hmm. tell you, we really enjoyed that. Now, what kind of shelters did you stay in? Were you well, in tents or tent. Kwanzaa huts? Or we had a tent. Tents? Oh, no, we didn't need mm -hmm. We had tents. Mm -hmm. And they were cold, and when we got there in March, it was still cold in Italy. Mm -hmm. And it isn't too sunny over there, either. Well, did you have much uh, contact with the Italian people at all? No, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd have to look for an Italian barber. Now and then they'd come around to the area and they'd give you a good shave and a haircut. And uh, now and then some of the farmers had come around trying to sell some of their produce. Mm -hmm. You didn't buy any milk. They had it. 
you would buy eggs. The first thing they wanted was two packs of cigarettes for one egg, but you could get them down to two eggs for one pack of cigarettes. And then you broke them right there in a pan or something to make sure they were fresh. And then you cooked them up on your little, well, we had these stoves we made out of 55 gallon drums. We cut them in half and cut a hole in it for a spout. Mm -hmm. And 88 millimeter empty shell casings, the German ones, they made excellent chimneys. <laughs> and you took sand and a little five quart can that the mm -hmm. rations came in, filled it full of sand. And from a tank outside, you ran a line of gasoline in. And you had a stopper on it, an adjustable thing. And you'd get that going, and it would heat your tent, and uh, you you could cook on it. Okay. Um, when did you uh, leave Italy? Finished up yes. uh, August seventh, nineteen forty-four. Mm -hmm. And then we had to wait for about. I didn't get home until about the fifteenth of September and we had to come home by ship and we got caught in that hurricane that tore up the boardwalk in Atlantic City that uh, and that was something I've never seen anything like that before and don't care to see another one again now when you returned to the states uh, were you where were you assigned then well I went to aircraft maintenance engineering school got through to that and then was assigned in Savannah, George, as a uh, desk work it was not for me. Mm -hmm. They told us we were going to be flight test pilots. And <laughs> that was something else. So we flight tested the forms and the <laughs> papers. And okay, um, do you remember where you were when uh, you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? And all, if, if that Mm, no, no, I do not. How about the end of the war, World War Two in Europe? Do you remember where you were when you heard about that? Uh, we're, yeah, we were uh, at um, aircraft maintenance engineering mm -hmm. school. And what was the reaction and the and the base? Good, that's done. Now we've got one more to go, mm -hmm. and that didn't come until around September, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were you out of the service by the time that ended? No. Or you were still in service? Do you remember hearing at all of what, your reaction when you heard about the atomic bombs being dropped? Well, it still saved one heck of a lot of mm -hmm. lives, both American and Japanese, mm -hmm. by wiping out those old, probably 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Because if we had to go in and take Japan afoot, there would have been millions lost mm -hmm. on both sides. Did you understand, you know, being a pilot, how one bomb could have created that much destruction? Well, that's Do you pilots even don't think about that. Uh, nuclear physicists. Yes, yes, I, I know. That. I just was wondering if you had a reaction that way. Um, when did you? When were you discharged? Oh, I don't remember exactly. I'd have to. It was uh, September. Right? Okay, you didn't have to know the day. Just September forty-five. Yeah. Um, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? I tried college, mm -hmm. but uh, college, uh, the world of academics, was not for me. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use it to buy a home or anything? Purchase a home. Well, I worked at a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, well, I always supported. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Did you ever make use of the fifty-two twenty club? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Of course, that uh, didn't last too long. Right. Okay. Did you do any flying after the war? No. No. The well, you might say I went back yeah. on active duty. Yeah. Uh, up at Limestone, Maine, uh, as a pilot, supposedly. 
uh, after a refresher training course at Kinston, North Carolina in T6s. Boy, were they old and worn out. They were left over from World War, the Civil War, I'd say. <laughs> now, what year was that? Uh, Approximately. 40, 42, I think. No, no, 52. Yeah, 52, 52 or, or, or 53, one of the other. Oh, okay. Were uh, you being prepared to go into the Korean War? And then I was assigned to Limestone, Maine to be third pilot on a B-36. And when I walked in the door of the, you know, the, the flight office, the man behind the desk, he said, here comes the adjutant now. And I looked around and there was nobody there but me. Paperwork again. Yeah. So how long were you in from 52 uh, to... Uh, I, I finally couldn't take the paperwork. and I was in a B-36 exactly three times. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they really didn't need pilots. I mean, they just thought they might, I suppose, and mm -hmm. caught a bunch of us old-timers back in. But, uh, and uh, out of nine that went to Limestone, I think there was a motor pool officer, a P6 officer, a commissary officer, a production control officer, an adjutant, and Lord knows how many others were really assigned to a B-36 group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how long did you stay in service that, that time? Well, I finally put in my resignation. Mm -hmm. Well, he wants to know how long. I think it was almost uh, two years. I was, and that came through May of 54, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, uh, two years. years. Okay. Just a, a little over a year. Mm -hmm. And you flew civil with, you were with the Civil Air Patrol in Albany. Well, too. later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you joined that. Uh, but a little old square tail Cessna 172 was but it was flying and it was reasonable. You could rent it then for nine dollars and fifty cents an hour, which nowadays I guess they get over a hundred and forty or fifty dollars for a Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the B-36 when you flew it? Frankly, it was a dog, but it put off World War III. Mm -hmm. uh, and the three times we landed in it, the skipper that flew it, he was the captain, mm -hmm. we took crash landing positions and now I know why. They actually described it as a controlled crash. And of course I never, I thought the gear was going to come right up through the wings, but it didn't. Okay, um, did you ever join any veterans organizations? Well, I was a member of the VFW for a few years. But mm -hmm. I don't know, you, you, you let that go kind of after a while. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Yeah, yeah. My tail gunner, my waist gunner Bob Shell, and recently we had uh, the flight engineer visit us. In fact, there were the three of us, the flight engineer, the tail gunner, myself, and then we went down to visit uh, shell the waste gunner but he couldn't do anything then because he had emphysema so bad but mm -hmm. the, there were four out of ten together isn't bad after all no, those years no. do you ever have any reunions uh your unit reunions or anything well you ever go when they start holding them out in omaha that's a yes. that's far to go and right. it gets to be expensive too mm -hmm. right mm. okay how do you think your time in the service uh, changed or had an effect on your life? Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Couldn't say. You went in, you did your job, and you came out, and you looked for another job to mm -hmm. do to make a living. Okay. All right, now you had some photographs you, you brought in. Uh, could you tell us about this one? If you hold it like this, Wayne will be able to focus on it. Now what, what is that? Well, when my ground chief, crew chief, got married, he got married at the uh, nunnery in uh, Naples that the government had taken over for the wax. 
And this was the wedding party that took off from near Fosia, where we were stationed. It was only a 90 mile flight. Mm -hmm. So we got all of these people into a B-17. Into one B-17? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they carry a lot of weight. Yes. But they were standing in the bomb bay, they were crowded in the nose, they were standing in there. We tried to keep them from the tail because a tail heavy airplane is no joke mm -hmm. to fly. Mm -hmm. Now where are you in that photograph? Can you pick yourself out? Have to put on glasses <laughs> to find out. Okay. I was raising a small soup strainer at the time. Yeah, right under the propeller. I think that's me right there. I'm not sure. Okay. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty hard. To... Okay. Now you have. What is this? This is the wedding invitation we received when my crew chief got married. Now, uh, it says Italy, 1944, ah, it's coming. And of course there's the shamrocks or something on there. And will that be able to pick out yes. the print that's yes. feasible? Yes. Then I'll let it just speak for itself. Okay, I got that. Okay. And you have this photograph. And this was right after the wedding. I handed the, the bride an envelope that the boys in the squadron had collected that contained fifteen hundred dollars. Wow. Because Bill was one good man. He never did any much work much himself, but he darn well saw that it was done. And uh, the funny thing there, he and the best man showed up about a half an hour late for the wedding. <laughs> and the lieutenant colonel in charge of the whackery, another whack of course, was saying, oh, if that bill stands up, my Nancy, I'll have him court-martialed. <laughs> so about five minutes later, Bill, and the best man stagger in holding each other up. <laughs> now this is a later photograph you said. Whoop, I'm sorry. Well, anyhow, it was funny. She was ready to pounce on Bill like that when she saw the best man with the eagles on his collar. <laughs> that ended that. And this is uh, in bride and groom's apartment at about three o'clock that morning. As you can see, nobody was feeling any pain, especially our squadron commander, the lieutenant colonel. <laughs> and, uh, okay. But a good time was had by all. And this is the couple. And I this believe. is the couple. Miss Nancy Reglin, and they call them Wild Bill Johnson. I don't know, he never was wild while I was there. Did you, did you bring the, okay. the photo that you were on, the camel? No. Oh, the one with the yeah. trip we made to Egypt? Mm. You didn't bring that. Is That's that okay. the one? No. no. Oh, no, this was taken out of the waste windows of one of our aircraft, and this is over Vienna. I don't know whose airplane or what, but... Boy, did they play a tune on your aircraft with this flak? I don't think I've ever seen a photograph with so much flak in it. Oh, yeah, you just have to look at one of these night photos mm -hmm. of Baghdad to the, uh, that oh, they had. Yes. They really threw it up. That was okay. Russian style. I couldn't see what they were shooting at, but they just thought if they threw enough of it up there, they would get it. And this is a photograph, a bomb strike photograph. I believe this was at Greece, Italy, and there was a machete aircraft factory there the Italians had. And that made a nasty little aircraft, especially when they put a German engine in it. 
and uh, they dropped a little soon and didn't get too much of the target, but some of these strikes, those other bombs you see, and then finally a little burst down here on a building, they were our bombs. Because the, I got a call from the radio operator, the bombs are hung. And uh, everybody reached for the red handle and pulled it, and this salvoed the bombs. <laughs> and away, away they went. And, well, there's, if you put these two together, no, no this was, I don't know what this one was, but they got the target. Pretty good, right there, and there was more going down. And this, if you put them together, oh, the right way. Like this, you can see the bombs going down. They took several photos as we were on the bomb run, and as they were going down, and then you can see where they hit in the marshalling yard. One of them must have been a tank or down there, a bright puff. Because don't forget, these things were taken from about at least three preferably four, and if we had anything to do with it, five miles up. <laughs> and that's it. Okay, well, you had uh, this. Yeah, that's the original hot pilot's hat. Hot pilot's hat, rather. You never cleaned them, you never washed them. It was thought to bring bad luck. Now, you wore that on all your missions? No, I wore it on the first one, when it was oh. so darn cold after that. <laughs> the same with that leather jacket. That. That was the coldest thing. After that, you piled on all the field jackets that the infantry wore. And that's the old 346 Bomb Squadron insignia. Now, what is, what is that insignia of? What's that? What is what it? What is it off? What is that? The snake around, a rattlesnake around a bomb. Okay. And, of course, the 15th Air Force patch. Now, you didn't wear that jacket all the time then because it wasn't warm enough? That's correct. This was good for movies like Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> now, now there's another patch over your squadron patch. Is, is that a name patch there? Uh, that's my name and wings, and I think... Well, before it disappeared, my name was in Arabic below it. Oh, okay. I had that done in Africa when I was... Uh -huh. Strange thing. The Germans weren't too dumb. They made an offer to the Arabs that they'd give them $15 for every, or the equivalent of $15 uh, for every American airman that they picked up and turned in. Well, we got wind of it. We upped the ante for $25, got all our pilots back. We got German pilots back. We got Italian pilots back. <laughs> but the Arabs were businessmen. So you, you actually... What, what kind of jackets did you wear when you went on your flights then? Well, uh, for low altitude, I wore the regular cloth-lined field jacket. Mm -hmm. And it was, we had uh, good helmets that had the uh, headsets and the microphones right in them. And uh, that took, retired that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, and then of course we had the heavy fleece-lined jackets and pants. Mm -hmm. And you left them unzipped while you were at low altitude because in the summertime the temperature inside that metal aircraft could be oh, well, well over 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then as you went up, it got colder and colder. And when the thermometer registered 40 degrees below centigrade, which is where the Fahrenheit scales meet, mm -hmm. and you were still going up, you know it got cold. And sometimes you had to scrape ice off the windshield. <laughs> they didn't have any windshield heaters. We had no heaters in the aircraft, by right. the way. Yeah. They tried the, oh, the glycol heaters, but it was highly flammable, so they got rid of that. And then they tried the exhaust heaters, that they ran another pipe around the exhaust manifold. But you get a piece of flak up through two of them, and you get all that carbon monoxide in the aircraft, 
So they did away with that one. And we froze. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thank you.